Greetings students and welcome to Mr. Musselman's online classroom. Today I'll be sharing with you about global wind currents. Before we launch into something as complex as global wind currents, we want to start with the basic foundation for how it works. Convection is one of three main ways heat is transferred. Convection is the transfer of heat by currents through a fluid. And remember, when we're talking about a fluid, we're talking about matter that takes on the shape of its container. And in that case, we're talking about liquids and gases. To illustrate this transfer of heat, let's use a pot of boiling water. In this case, the heat source is down at the bottom, here at the base of our pot. The water molecules directly above this point are heating up the fastest. And when we say that they're heating up, we mean that they are taking on more heat energy, which means they're moving around faster and faster, and they're actually becoming less dense. When these molecules begin to become less dense, they start to rise towards the top of the pan. The cooler water at the uh, edges of the pot will actually rush in to take the place of this rising warmer water because that, because that warm water is leaving more empty space at the bottom of the pan and the denser, colder water wants to rush in to take the, that leftover space. The result of this motion of water creates what are known as convection currents continuously flowing uh, matter uh, from the hotter source uh, to a colder area. Over time, the motion of all of this water matter from the bottom to the top in this repeating cycle will bring the temperature of the entire uh, pot uh, to a higher boiling temperature. Now remember, if we put a lid on this, we'd actually have the same thing happening uh, in the air between the water and the pot top. We'd have air rising up towards the top of the pot, and when it reached that top, it would probably be deflected towards the outer edges. And meanwhile, we would have cooler air rushing from the side, kind of coming in towards that center to take its place. So we would have convection currents both in the liquid uh, the boiling water below and also in the gas that was trapped by the pot between the boiling water and the lid. Pop the top and what happens? Well, all that hot air and steam, it rises up and out of the pot and this cold air from the outside, well, it's going to rush in to take its place. On Earth, we have something a little more complex going on. The sun's solar radiation is beating down on our Earth's surface. And remember, this radiation is another way that heat is transferred. Um, in this case, this radiation is traveling uh, more than 149 million miles away from the sun to the Earth. If we look carefully, we can see that the sun is actually... Uh, hitting the Earth's surface at different angles. Here on uh, the equator and by the tropics, the angles that we're seeing it, the sun reach the Earth are very close to right angles, or uh, in the case of the equator, uh, during the equinox, we have a perfect 90 degree angles. Whereas that same sun, uh, sun radiation coming from uh, the sun uh, on the polar regions is actually a much smaller angle, uh, an acute angle less than 90 degrees. Uh, this actually plays a role in how much energy is actually uh, reaching the surface and being received or absorbed, and the result is that our equ equator areas end up receiving more total solar energy than our polar areas, both in the north and also uh, down here in the south. Knowing what we know from our earlier convection examples, 
we can predict that the air above the equator is the hottest air and would therefore be rising while air at the north and south pole would be the coldest air and would therefore be sinking. Now if our earth were remaining perfectly still this would work out to be the beginnings of a very large convection current. We'd have our air eventually reaching a point where it would begin to uh, rise towards uh, the North Pole or towards the South Pole as it started to cool and then air that was sinking at the poles would actually begin to travel towards the equator and would do so across all areas of Earth. So what you would end up getting is this northerly wind from um, <clears throat> the northern hemisphere and a southerly wind from the southern hemisphere. And that would be prevailing over pretty much the entire globe. Unfortunately, it's not that easy because the Earth is constantly rotating. Our Earth rotates from the east to the west. And when you look at this from the north, this actually creates a clockwise motion. But if you look at it from the southern pole towards the center of the Earth, it uh, appears to move counterclockwise. Regardless of where you're looking at the Earth from, this is going to have an impact on the Earth's global wind currents. The air that rises at the equator will begin to deflect towards the north and the south. But around 30 degrees latitude, this convection current begins to lose some steam and it will actually start to sink back towards the Earth's surface and then complete the convection current by flowing back towards the equator. In the polar regions, that sinking air is going to begin flowing towards the equator, but around 60 degrees uh, latitude, it too is actually uh, going to kind of begin its own rising up because it, it, it will, after all, begin warming, uh, just like the air in the tropical um, current was beginning to cool and it too will actually start to complete its convection current uh, in the polar area. The convecting flow of these two currents are actually going to create a third kind of moderately temperatured current that will follow the patterns of the other two currents and create a third uh, what's considered a Hadley cell, um, <clears throat> a large uh, convection current in our Earth's atmosphere. This isn't just happening in the northern hemisphere, it's also happening in the southern hemisphere. Now remember, the air isn't just rising here along the side of our Earth, it's actually rising all along the equator. Right? In these actually large, almost donut-like uh, convection currents that completely encircle uh, the northern and southern hemispheres. Because the air is rising here along the equator uh, <clears throat> and not moving across the Earth, uh, this this area of Earth posed a particular problem to early sailors uh, because there was no horizontal wind to fill their sails. Uh, as a result, they would say that they were often stuck in the doldrums, which is where this area of Earth gets its name. Likewise, the area just around 30 degrees northern latitude was also a particularly sticky area uh, for sailors because the air there 
would be sinking and not moving horizontally across the Earth's surface as we see here and here. Occasionally, English traders would get stuck in these uh, areas uh, with large cargoes of horses and unable to feed them, they would have no choice but to push them overboard, which gave the unfortunate name to this area, the Horse Latitudes. Aside from the region around 60 degrees north and south of the equator, uh, the rest of the Earth's surface appears to have some sort of horizontal wind moving across it whether you're down here between 0 and 30 degrees latitude north and south or 30 and 60 degrees south and north or even between 60 and 90 and 90 degrees being the north pole and the south pole along all these areas we see wind actually moving across the surface these are our global wind currents while earth's weather can be technically unpredictable we generally find that Earth's weather moves along with these patterns. Now, these wind currents may appear like they simply either move from north to south, like here in the poles, or south to north, as we see between 30 and 60 degrees latitude. Right? But this is not the case, because again, our Earth isn't just sitting still. It is constantly rotating along its axis, which causes our wind to appear to sort of be deflected or turned uh, in, in a certain direction. Since air is not attached to the Earth's surface, it suffers from what is known as the Coriolis effect. In the northern hemisphere, this causes wind currents to appear to turn clockwise. This was actually very fortuitous for European travelers to the New America, and they actually called these the trade winds because of the boost that they, tr they provided for trade between Europe and the New Continent. Between 30 and 60 degrees latitude, our wind currents appeared to curve again clockwise and towards the right, and these currents became known as the prevailing westerlies. As we can see, the prevailing westerlies cover most of the United States, which is why the weather patterns in the U.S. tend to have weather moving from the west coast of the US towards the east coast. Last but certainly not least, the polar easterlies, uh, clearly lesser valuable uh, trade winds uh, for early travelers because of their extreme northern latitudes. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, coat that region of the North Pole and the South Pole and they are known as the polar easterlies. Now, as you can expect, we see a similar pattern in the southern hemisphere. Only there, the Coriolis effect causes the winds to appear to turn in a counterclockwise direction. Altogether, this continuous flow of air on our Earth creates the global wind currents. The global wind currents stem from an unequal heating of the Earth's surface, with the, equators, uh, get the equator gathering heat energy and spreading it out in, by convection towards the mid-latitude and polar areas of our Earth. This concludes Mr. Musselman's mini-lesson. If you have any questions, comments, or an idea for a future topic, don't hesitate to leave it on the uh, comments section of this video. Thanks, and have a great day.